Hi, welcome. This is uh, Become the Change We Want to See, a recorded event for Texas AEYC annual conference. Um, I am here together, I'm Dr. Josh Thompson. I'm here together with Dr. Lindsay Wilson and Dr. Marta Mercado Sierra. <clears throat> I come to you as a um, agent working with young children and their families. I am <clears throat> the child of a robust family uh, and I am the husband of one and father of four and grandfather to 11, they call me Billy. I am an early childhood teacher. I'm a Montessori man and I'm a college professor teaching early childhood teachers at Texas A&M University Commerce. I go through all of those different iterations of my identity to tell you about myself before I get to one that says, oh, oh yeah, I'm a white guy. That is a privilege. And I've learned through this collaborations with my colleagues, how much privilege that is that race and, and ethnicity is not something I just open with and lead with. I am here in North Texas, what we know now as North Texas, on stolen land of the Kikapua, the Humanas, the Tawakami, and the Wichita indigenous people. Thank you for welcoming me onto your presentation. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Thompson, for that introduction and that land acknowledgement. And I, too, would like to acknowledge that we are on stolen land built by stolen labor. And good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Lindsay Wilson. I am an African-American woman. I'm a family member, daughter, granddaughter, sister, niece, cousin, and so forth. I'm a community member with shared lived experiences, generational joy, tradition, and trauma. One who has been and continues to be impacted by the ways in which institutionalized racism has and continues to impact communities of color. I am an equity champion recognizing the importance of each person's unique histories, experiences, and characteristics. I'm a doctor who studied educational psychology, learning sciences, and human development, whose work meets at the intersection of race, gender, community engagement, and social economics. I'm a proud early childhood advocate, one who spent over 10 years in various early childhood settings from mental health consultant to program coordinator, a home visitor for early Head Start program. And it is important for me to share my multiple identities that all are a part of who I am, what I have experienced, believe, and what drives the change that I want to see. I am Dr. Lindsay Wilson, a dedicated individual to equity in every aspect of my life, and I'm thrilled to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you. You're on mute. Hello, I'm Martha Mercado Sierra. Um, if you can see, I have included here my professional and academic identity. Um, but before that, I'm a Puerto Rican woman, um, born in Puerto Rico. My childhood was in Texas, back to Puerto Rico for my academic um, studies. And I'm back to Texas, um, maybe nine, nine and a half years ago. Um, I come from Puerto Rico. We call it a territory of the United States, but we really are a colony of the United States. So the people who are born there, live there, um, have this colonized mind. Um, if we look at history, we have been colonized from Spain first and then the US. So it's, for me, it's very challenging um, 
to be like totally informal because we have been indoctrinated to be formal and to project the dominant culture of the United States. And that's what my presentation reflects um, of myself, that formal part of me. But I'm a simple woman, Puerto Rican. I still have issues with people calling me Dr. Marta Mercado Sierra as Mr. Thompson, Joe Thompson, I mean, Josh Thompson knows. Um, I'm more simple than that. I am more than the doctor. So I'm a mom, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. I'm black, brown, white. That's what makes my brown color. Um, <laughs> um, from a native heritage, African heritage and Spaniard heritage that many people don't understand or get. So I thank you for inviting me. I am a champion of equity, equality, um, inclusion, social justice, and my profession is social work, although my passion is education. Thank you for welcoming to this conference. So that's us individually, but look at us. We are three. We are a team, and we've really enjoyed our collaborations in various writing projects and symposia that we've hosted and launched. And really enjoy, not enjoy, that's not the right word. We've really dug into the work of identity and shared passions. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I can appreciate hearing um, each of your experiences, right? And so when we think about uh, diversity, inclusion, equality and equity, which I'll talk a little bit about later on um, during our time together. I think it's really about sitting and hearing not only um, people's education, but their lived experiences, what makes them who they are, right? And so um, it's interesting. And, and Dr. Thompson, I know we've had this conversation uh, quite a bit of times around how we describe ourselves. And so I offer to all of those who are participating on this in this breakout session to think about how you describe yourself, what comes first and in what order. Dr. Wilson, now that you say that, um, I've been reflecting, I'm writing on that right now on how your identity can so you don't have only one identity and you mentioned several a while ago, right? So how they move and shift depending on the context. For example, when I was living in Puerto Rico, there wasn't much diversity there. We were all Puerto Rican or there were some Dominicans, Cubans, more from the Latin Hispanic Caribbean heritage. Um, so it was really easy for me to identify more as a feminist in Puerto Rico. Moving back to Texas now with more information, um, different from when I moved here at eight, then my, the identity that took forefront is that I am a brown Hispanic instead of a feminist. I'm still a feminist, but what has taken forefront right now is that I am a Hispanic or Latina or Latinx um, brown woman. So the feminist, is still there, but it's not how I would present myself as the first description, as the forefront. So it's really important to understand how context can shift those different identities. I think it's just amazing. And I had never thought about that till I moved back to Texas, that I count myself saying, not saying I'm feminist because that was the first thing I would say in Puerto Rico. So it's really interesting how we need to look at all those identities that we possess and how do they take forefront in different moments and different contexts. It's just so amazing. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Mercado. We want to explore this conversation of identities in the context of change that here we sit in isolation, three different uh, Zoom windows, 
and who knows however many places you are sitting there watching us, but we are going forward into a time after pandemic when the work that we do as people, as individuals, as collaborators, has a purpose, has a function, has a context for change that we want to be intentional rather than victims. Yes, we are victims of this pandemic that's been thrust upon us, but we've had agency within certain elements that these are the things we can control. And we invite you to this conversation at Texas AEYC to think about the context for change after the pandemic for early childhood education. What pieces of our work with young children have been um, subjugated to external forces? The school system itself is based around an agrarian model with this huge summer event. They didn't invent that for Disney vacations or beach time. The way that we have structured a schooling system has a lot of antiquated ideas baked into it. And this is an opportunity, this is a moment for us, particularly thinking around workforce elements thinking through how does this moment of challenge between ample, safe, secure, quality childcare match the demand, the need for a workforce that's transitioning. They're still at home and they're still at, on commutes and they're still on um, uh, Zoom and distance connections, and yet their children need care. And, and these families need us in terms of considering how does our educational uh, imperative, our, our educational quality standards meet together with the need in the marketplace. Um, of course, there are, you know, market considerations. Uh, you can't have a school without adequate funding and adequate pay, but yet we can have this uh, higher calling, the higher priority of what's best for young children. Um, we have some resources we'll look at to the end of this conversation, but just for, for this moment, dwell in that to think about what is it about our future education that we want to make sure is included. Ooh, thank you for that, Dr. Thompson, and for addressing how education quality standards meet with the marketplace. And I wanna expound on that and, and expound and pivot the conversation to integrate what we've known to be a dual pandemic at this time. And so as we're talking about the shifts and context and following uh, COVID-19, it's also critical to note the disparities that were amplified as a result of COVID-19, right? And so we say amplified because the inequities existed prior to COVID-19. And what we know to be true is unless we are intentional about tackling the many inequities, they will continue to persist, persist, excuse me. So within the last six months, we have seen several cities name racism as a public health crisis from Boston to Milwaukee, a number of counties in Ohio, Nebraska, and Michigan, with Dallas being one of the largest cities. And this is particularly important because while the world is dealing with the implications of COVID-19, the Black community is also dealing with the persistence of racism as a second pandemic, and as in essence, a dual pandemic. And as race dictates outcomes across every system, whether we're talking about housing, health, wealth, what we know to be true 
is education is not exempt. Research continues to show the ways in which black boys are suspended from preschool at a disproportionate rate, the ways that uh, the impact of stress from dealing with racism negatively uh, impacts pregnant families, the ways that implicit bias shows up in classrooms as early as pre-K, right? And, and Dr. Thompson, I know this is, this is your, another area of your specialty around the lack of male educators, right? Particularly within early childhood education. But also if we look at it one step further, the lack of black male early childhood educators. And that speaks to the false narratives about who black men are as fathers, as men, and the value that they have to, to offer their families, children, and other students. And research continues to show in spite black men being actively involved, regardless of their residential status, and based on CDC data, they are at higher levels than any other race of fathers um, as it relates to uh, just being engaged in daily uh, household activities, whether that's getting the kids dressed, doing their hair, um, helping with homework, these men are still often described based on their residential status and income. So there's a huge disconnect there. And so as we talk about equity or early childhood education, and, and, and the change we want to be, equity is critical, which we've seen in the recent years, right, within early childhood organizations who have centered their mission around the advancement of equity. And I believe, Dr. Thompson, you'll explore some of those resources later on in the hour. But one of the things that I want to do, um, I, I, given, given my uh, time, is to highlight the difference not only between equality and equity, but other key uh, terms that sometimes are misused or not clarified. Uh, so if I can just take a minute to do that. Uh, we know that, that diversity is a representation of many different types of individuals across dimensions, whether that be race, gender ability, religion, sexual orientation, social economic status, and so forth. Whereas inclusion speaks to the intentional act of welcoming various populations and creating an environment that allows marginalized individuals to feel included and to be themselves. Equality, on the other hand, refers to this notion of fairness, which many of us were raised on, right? We all get, it's three of us on this call, all of us should get the same exact time to speak. There's three marbles, three of us on this call, we each get one. But what equity actually does is it takes into consideration each person's unique identities, circumstances, and history, right? And so when we're thinking about resources and services and, and so forth, that is critical. And with all that being said, as we start shifting and, and, and becoming what we want to see, we need to take all of that into consideration. And a couple of questions that I would love to, to leave you with is, what does the new norm mean for you as an educator? Right? And how does that new norm benefit or burden communities of color? particularly Black families. Again, as we're coming out, what is known to be a dual pandemic um, based on real lived experiences within communities of color, um, including the Black community. And lastly, what is anti-Blackness? And how does that show up in your classroom? Research would show that Anti-Blackness starts as early as preschool. And so it's not enough to dispel any anti-Blackness um, missed by addressing racism or biases. We must counter it by embracing and affirming Blackness. And we have to do it 
at this very young age. Thank you. Hello again. Um, going back to the pandemic, um, and I put, if you've noticed, I put the 2020 pandemic as an opportunity to construct the world we imagine. Um, this pandemic, and I am not talking about only the COVID-19, but the rampant, tangible, visible racism that we have seen during this year. Is that, it's not new this year. I think that social media has really made it tangible for us to see. It's not implicit, it's totally explicit. And I understand some people might be able to see it, to recognize and acknowledge racism because it is now more visible and tangible. Because after um, the civil movement, the strategy had became very, um, we call it unconscious bias. We call it um, implicit bias or implicit racism, classism, genderism, et cetera. So it wasn't so to your forefront. You did not see it in front of you because it was so implicit. Um, but now with the last events that we have seen, um, in the social media, it has become more tangible for people. And I think that's one of the reasons there's so much movement from diverse populations against racism in this case. So we have COVID-19 and racism that intersect in 2020. What are we going to do as educators? Well, we think about what we're going to do in the classroom, but before that, and I will um, and I agree with Dr. Wilson, we need to look at ourselves first. We need to do critical thinking. We need to look where we stand, have a reflection. Where do we stand? What are our values? What, which, which values do we live with? Not just talk about, preach, but what values takes our direction to exist, to live? to coexist. Um, and after that, we need to take action, right? Because after we reflect, we need to take actions with ourselves and actions within our community, in our case, within our schools. And that action should be to respect and value all people, equity and inclusion. And you've heard these three concepts throughout the 30 minutes we've been speaking. So you might understand that that's where we're um, going to. Um, you can go ahead with the next slide, um, Dr. Thompson. Um, I think it jumped. It's the one that says education practice is political practice. I don't see that one. So tell us what that slide okay. says. Well, there was a slide on education practice is political practice. Sometimes we say, oh, we don't want to get into politics. No, we're political beings because we assume positions. Education is not neutral. That does not exist. We assume positions at the moment we're standing in front of our students, talking to them, because language reflects ideology. And that's why that self-reflection is so important. And in our system, the education system promotes the dominant culture of groups at this historical moment. And we cannot not see that. What it's in the curriculum. It's the dominant culture that that's what they want us to present, to educate. And we need to look at that critically. And we need to create changes if we really want to move towards equality, equity, inclusion, and of course, social and economic justice. Um, because education 
is the foundation of our cultural, social, economic, political development. We learn through our system of education. And we decide, since I mentioned a while ago, it's not neutral, we decide what ideology to promote within our classrooms. Is it equity? Or is it some people have more opportunities than others? And we reflect that in our daily interactions in our classroom. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, practice in our classrooms, just to things that I've done in the classroom, things that I try to do in the classroom, um, because just as you, I struggle within the dominant culture, the structure where I work at, and that's not just my institution, but higher education. It's, it's a education which has a structure and it determines what we teach in some sense, although we have um, freedom of teaching, but is within the structure that emulates those um, values from the dominant culture. So in the slide is that our hope is our education practice. That's my hope because we are developing the future leaders. We influence over our children. Um, so we need to be very careful and delicate of how we do project this in our classroom. And I think one of the first values that we have to assume is the humbleness to embrace learning from those who we educate. So we need to go into the classroom humble enough to understand that we're not only facilitating a teaching process, but we're also educating ourselves from the students that we have. So for that, we need to respect the cultural identity of each student. And that it's complicated sometimes, it's challenging sometimes. Um, and I've had the experience of living in two different countries and it was really easy for me to say, oh, I'm up for equity and inclusion. Oh, yes. But it's really easy to say that when you're with people who look like you, who think like you. But it's very challenging for us to really believe the same or adopt those values in practice when you're surrounded by different people. And that's the opportunity for you to really challenge yourself and really see if you're that person you want to be or how much is it that you have to learn from them to really be the person you want to be. Um, differentiate from theoretical context to concrete context. When I mean concrete context is the context the students live in. It's not the context that are in our books or your context. So you need to have that clear. Those are two, there's not two, you will have many different contexts. And you want to be there to really learn about the dreams that your student has, what the language they use, what do they know, how do they know it? All of that is very important because not all of us learn the same way. We don't all have the same opportunities. So you need to differentiate those different contexts each of our students are at. Um, concerning language, and this is something that we need to be careful, again, I'm saying this again, um, because we usually um, shame students by their use of language, especially if they come from different cultures. And language shaming is very detrimental um, to the development of that student. Um, diverse, diverse syntax or diverse prosody um, should be valued equally. That does not mean that we're not teaching students the proper or the formal use of language, but we should teach it in a way that they understand that's a tool for them to reduce this advantage, to reduce injustice, to reduce discrimination. 
not because their language is not valued the same as yours. So I think that's something very concrete that you can catch on when we're talking about the practice in the classroom, um, when we practice equity in the classroom. So I think it's also important to generate, stimulate, and favor participation, decision-making, especially in those preschool um, levels of education. Um, when we receive students in higher education, they're scared to think out of the box. They don't wanna share what they really think. They are so indoctrinated to just follow instructions and just repeat what you're saying. So this is something that we learn from very early age. And I think early education gives us that opportunity. The pandemic that we are living right now, it's a feature that has been open. So we have to look at it as an opportunity for change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Mercado. These are important frames for us to think about this moment of change. I, I am overwhelmed with the, the key word I heard from Dr. Mercado about being humble as we go into this moment, because the opposite is also needed, being brave and courageous while you're humbly going through this respect for all learners at the table. We have a list of uh, resources for us to consider that you're uh, taking with you. Um, think about the work of the National Association for the Education of Young Children in writing this Advancing Equity in Early Childhood Education, the position statement published in 2019 for a moment such as this, for us to take that guidance of our colleagues from many voices, from many strands, families, languages, perspectives, ethnicities, identities, and looking at our work with intentionality. Otherwise, the dominant culture will define for us what our post-pandemic experience will be like. I challenge uh, us to examine the, the work um, from the organization called Teaching Tolerance and look at their social justice standards as tools for us to consider this moment of change. And I'll just do a higher level overview on a few of the resources because I would like to dig deeper into the conversation um, across the three of us. Uh, a couple of the resources that, that you can find on this page is uh, the new Barbie and Nikki discussion on racism, right? And so historically, um, what we know to be true as black and brown families have had the conversation about racism at a much younger age um, than white families, right? And so we're talking three, four, five years old, starting to um, help their children understand uh, the experiences that they will face. And so I feel uh, on October 7th, um, Barbie, and Nikki had a discussion about racism. And so, and I found it to be extremely empowering because um, it highlights that children are not too young and we have to challenge the myth that talking about race makes you racist, right? And so that was a, that is, a, is an example of, of how we can begin to integrate uh, this discussion. The strength of our young black boys talks about um, the disparities that we see in young African-American boys as it relates to uh, they're more likely to be suspended and the prison or the preschool to prison pipeline. And, and, and it gives examples of what parents can do to foster a stronger relationship with schools. Um, but as educators, I, I, I wanted to include that resource 
And so that we can lead those conversations and not put the onus back on parents. A uh, couple of other resources just talks about the impact of racism on children. Uh, and then there's a resource I asked a reflection question earlier on about anti-Blackness. So there's a resource there that shows the ways in which it starts to show up in preschool classrooms. Uh, and then the last is teach, train, love. And so those are, those are a few resources, but I'm excited to dive in. I know we have about five, six more minutes left to dive into dialogue around um, what we each highlighted. I don't see uh, Dr. Marta Mercados. I will look for those resources uh, right now while you start talking about them, Dr. Mercado. Dr. Mercado, you're muted. I can't believe that I don't get the muting, unmuting with all of these conferences that we have daily. <laughs> but um, sorry, one of the things I would like you to explore are the writings of Paulo Freire. He's an educator, he, he's from Brazil. And lots of the information I shared with you today are part of his philosophy. And he writes, he, most of his writing is for adult education, but he does have some writings for children. And there's an interesting book that he has is the letters for educators. And it's, Excellent. Um, I think that besides looking at specific information of how to do things maybe in the classroom, um, we should read also things that can inspire us to reflect on ourselves, how we do things in the classroom. Um, so Paulo Freire is one of those authors that helps us think about that. There's another resource that um, I, I use is the Century Foundation and the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. There's a lot of information there. There's even a manual on how to, let me find the title of that. It's how to work with equity in preschools and early education. So that's one of the resources you can look up. And if we don't find it, um, Dr. Thompson, we can um, just add it at the end. Um, so those are three resources that I wanted to, to point out to you. Well, this is a growing topic. This is an honor to participate in this level of discussion and reflection and mirroring and seeing through windows into other people's worlds and then opening the sliding glass doors and walking right through into other lived experiences. This work as adults in care of young children empowers the children to uh, take up the work themselves as well. Other reflections, closing thoughts? Well, I look forward to, um, well, we're taping it early, so I look forward to Saturday the 17th to, to answer questions, to, to continue this dialogue um, with, with, with the participants. Yes, we do. And uh, the last um, uh, screen share would be to uh, 
look at a hashtag. Let's explore a hashtag EC change as a place for us to continue this conversation virtually online. And then uh, this uh, website will be live and posted in next to this broadcast inside the TAYC uh, conference center. And it's my uh, faculty web address, Josh Thompson at Texas A&M University Commerce and the hashtag, the backslash EC change. Marta, do you have the last word? Bring us out. I'm also looking forward to listening to you, learning from you on the 17th. Um, and remember, we are the ones that develop our leaders. So let's get to it. <laughs>